fun to play social control games, just to see who actually conforms and who doesn't. I can wait. I, can, I don't get paid on an hourly rate, so I'm happy to wait. Uh, how are you all doing? Oh, don't be so fucking enthusiastic. Um, okay. Everyone have a nice week off. Did everyone take a week off? Did anyone go to any of the things that were organised last week? What things? What things is the best answer? <laughs> I, myself, wasn't even in the country. I think this was the best solution to study week that I've ever had, actually. Otherwise, I would have been sitting in my office alone for weeks. Um, okay. Two important things, first of all. I've been really busy the last fortnight, so I'm going to drop a bomb on Chris and Evelyn after this lecture. And I'm going to ask them tomorrow in their seminar groups to cover assignment three because originally we were going to cover it next week. Next week there won't be any seminars and there won't be a lecture. Okay? This is because of the industrial action by the UC York um, Union, of which I am a member and I know Chris is a member and I believe Evelyn is a member too. So it means that there won't be a lecture on Thursday and there will not be seminars on Friday because those are the two strike days next week. Following week it is Wednesday, 
So if you have anything scheduled on Wednesday, it's unlikely that there will be anything on. However, you need to check with the individual lecturer. I can only speak for myself. So, when there's industrial action, what we are supposed to do is not give you anything for that period that we are on industrial action for. I don't agree with that principle. In fact, I don't actually agree with the principle of this strike. I don't. But I am duty bound to do it because I am part of the union. Um, so I will be on strike. But fortunately, next week's topic I've lectured previously via recording. So I still have the recordings. I am not really intending on changing much of the content for what I was going to deliver next week, so the recordings will be perfectly fine. I will make them available on Canvas for you. So it's not ideal, and I'm not happy with it, but at least you will have the lecture to go over. You know, do it in this time, seeing as your timetable for it. And it, actually, the recording is a lot less than two hours. So it's about an hour's worth of content, something like that. It is quite important because it's um, McLuhan and medium theory, which a lot of students tend to do for the essay. I encourage you to do it for the essay for the sole reason that the essay, one, I like that essay, <laughs> one, so it already puts me in a good mood when students do it, and two, the essay is actually quite straightforward. So I would encourage you, if you're interested in doing that, watch the content, don't be put off about doing the final assessment on that, because people who've had to do it previously, when we were going through COVID, when lectures were recorded, there was no difference whatsoever. And I guess the benefit of it is, I suppose it works because we're recording the lectures anyway, but the benefit of it is you can watch it back and go over stuff and what have you. If there's anything you don't understand from next week's lecture, again, I'm on strike. I'm not supposed to be answering emails. I will. Okay? That doubly goes for the fact that you are handed in an assignment the week afterwards. So for Thursday, Friday, and the following Wednesday, I'm not supposed to be working, which means I'm not supposed to be reading drafts. I'm going to waive that. Okay? If you want me to read drafts of your assignment three, and you send them during those days, for that purpose alone, as far as I'm concerned, I'm working. Okay, so I will read those drafts and I will get back to you as soon as possible. <coughs> Has anyone got any questions about this? No? Okay. It's unfortunate. We had a whole bunch of this last in, in, in the last academic year, February and March. It achieved nothing apart from making me thousands of pounds worse off. Interest rates have gone up, cost of living has gone up, and I'm still going to be thousands of pounds worse off. And I still think it's going to achieve nothing. All it achieves is disruption to what you guys are trying to do. Which, so, as you can guess, I'm not really that front. But, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You know, I do so much bad shit at work. Stealing things, slagging people off, you know, uh, threatening people, actually having physical altercations with people. I need the union, because otherwise my ass is going to get sacked, so I have to go. If I'm not in the union, I'm fucked. All right, so I, I need the union. I'm actually the union representative <coughs> of the communication. Can you imagine when, like, if anything bad happens and I have to go and see Richard Thomas? It's like it gets fixed because I just go in and it's like, Rich, do this one. It's not going to be great. Um, this week we are still, I guess in the realms of Marxism, okay? The Frankfurt School is a really, really important philosophical and cultural movement from the early part of the 20th century that informs a huge amount of criticism and knowledge about the workings of the media and what the media produces. So the focus is not necessarily on the business model of media, today, but on actually what is produced and what we consume as media consumers ourselves. Texts, films, television programs, radio, you know the list, right? 
etc., etc., etc. So the Frankfurt School are interested in culture. Culture in general, how the media creates a wider culture for us understanding. And before we go any further, what is the role of the media in terms of reality? Call back to week one. In so much, so what does it do? In a way, it warps. Like, don't, go, when, don't go so far. But, I don't know. <laughs> you are like 99% right, Ash. Media creates reality. Our reality is mediated. We, as a, say we, you, understand the world itself through the media you consume. It is impossible for any individual to have a rounded understanding of the world without the media. We are simply limited in terms of what we can do, where we can do it, how we can do it, and what time we do it. So most of our understanding, the vast majority of our understanding of the world itself, comes from the media we consume. So the Frankfurt School are interested in the fundamental construction of reality as it is culture. How is culture produced? What goes into culture? What culture is made? And how does that affect the reality of our situation and how we perceive reality itself? So this is fundamental stuff. Their critique is pretty powerful. The key word here being industry. The Frankfurt School sees the media as taking an industrial approach to the construction of reality itself. That it is done along industrial mass production line. You find something which is popular, doesn't matter if it's any good or not, and then you mass produce that popular culture and feed it to people in order to feed revenue, in order to create revenue, in order to create a business model, in order to underpin the stuff that we've been talking about the first couple of weeks. This does not mean that culture is a good thing. In fact, the Frankfurt School are, as a group of thinkers, deeply, deeply cynical about what culture is produced by the media industries and the nature of the culture that is produced by the media industries. They argue that culture itself has become disposable, has become non-political, has become a transmission device for dominant ideologies within capitalist society. And that's why I say we're still in the realms of Marxism, because that effectively was the argument that I covered in week four when we looked at the political economy, the mass media. So for the Frankfurt School, all of that happens, and it happens on an industrial scale. And the effects of that are really, really important. Now, has anyone seen this film? Can I have a show of hands, please, if you've seen <coughs> Bride Wars? Unsurprisingly, everyone who's putting their hand up is female. Okay, would anyone like to tell me what Bride Wars is about? Um, it's about two best friends who get engaged at around the same time, um, and then their dream venue is like there's only one slot, so they're basically like fighting over it and get pranks and, and all that. Comedy ensues. Comedy ensues? Yes. I somehow doubt it. <laughs> I, I am, I am sceptical as to whether there is any comedic content of this film. I've not seen Bright Wars, okay? But I've seen this poster. I've seen this fucking poster a million times. Doesn't matter, you can take Kate Hudson and Anne Hathaway out of the poster and put two other interchangeable actresses in it and I've seen the poster before. I think the plot is well summarised. Thank you very much. Um, what's the point? Yeah, usually films have a point. Tallulah. But, um, friendship matters more than anything material. Is that true? No. no. <laughs> Maybe I, I don't think it's true anyway. As soon as they need to get like one slot, it just kind of shows their true colours and has a little like, fight. <sighs> They're all like friends and all that, and they've got that time slot. So friendship disappears when material, you know, 
Material worth is important. I mean, it's kind of a loaded question, what's the point? There is no point. This film has no value. Okay? It is a completely disposable, worthless piece of shit. An hour and a half of watching pretty people argue over something which is completely unimportant. And watching pretty people, and let must be fair, you know, Kate Hudson, attractive actress, Anne Hathaway has a restraining order against me. You know, uh, so, you know, 500 yards. Um, these things happen. There's, you know, misinterpretation. Um, who is this for? Who, what is it? We've got the synopsis of the film, we know who's in it. Who is it for? Women. Women, you bitches. What is going on here? Why is this for you? What is, what is happening? Why would this appeal to women? They're like the stereotype that like a woman should always think about like their wedding or like what they're going to do. Why is the wedding so important to women? Okay, this is a genuine question. I don't know the answer. I've never been married, right? Um, why are weddings so important to women? Oh, there's loads of women in this room. Somebody must have an answer. You've all, you, you, uh, according to popular culture, you've all dreamed about getting married. There might be a clue in what I just said. Sarah? Like, um, like the whole, like, maybe having some more control in Ooh. something in their life. Control of what? Like, um, like over like the wedding planning and stuff, like obsessing over that, right? Like, um, it's interesting to me that the cultural trope here is, you know, women are obsessed by planning weddings because, ostensibly, what you do is give control of your identity to a man when you actually do it. Which is kind of grim if you look at it in those things. But I'm a kind of grim individual, as you already all know now, right? Okay. Well, the question here, what is this for, is a loaded question. It's not for anything. This film has been re-released. It has been done, not in this specific narrative context, but the idea of two best friends who fall out over, usually it's a man, over and over and over again. Why do you think... One is blonde and one is brunette. <laughs> it's a really easy answer. Why? Beauty standards? Pardon? Beauty standards? Absolutely. Classically, the beauty standards of Hollywood are expressed in blonde. Yeah. The brunette is there to provide a differentiation from the plant. The beautiful one versus usually the kind of evil one. I'm speaking in broad strokes here because none of this is of course true. None of this applies to everyday life in any way, shape or form. This is how Hollywood constructs a particular generic set of conventions in order to be sold. Now my point here is this, I don't need to see this film. No one actually needs to see this film because we've seen it. We've seen it a million times over and we will keep on seeing it because it keeps on being produced. In fact, the vast majority of Netflix's production of films seems to be along these fucking lines. I don't know what Netflix as a company thinks about cinema making, but from what I can tell, their entire strategy is let's remake the 90s and early 2000s and remake the tropes of that time, even though they don't apply anymore. Bride Wars is an inherently worthless piece of crap. Does anyone have any idea how much money it made? One trillion. Hmm? One trillion. Anyone want to put, somebody look it up for me? You've all got computers in front of you. Type in Bride Wars into Google. Tell me. What was the box office take? 140.5 million dollars. Holy shit. 140 million. So, 
Rough guess, five bucks a ticket. Anyone want to tell me? Come on, maths geniuses in here. How many millions of people? I've already worked it out in my head, but how many millions of people went to watch this roughly? It's about 28 million. On a 30 million budget, this made 110 million profit. 110. Can you imagine what I could do with 110 million? I could kill myself through coke and hookers before I spent the first million. There'd be a huge amount left over. So, 110 million dollars. That's not even big. Industrially, pieces of crap like this are made because we know this will make money. This reaffirms a certain set of cultural ideas that the woman's role in contemporary society is not to be independent, is not to be the main money maker, is not to be career focused, it is instead to be focused on the acquisition of a man above all other things in order to have fulfillment as an individual and as a human being. I, I hope every woman in here is looking at me with daggers. I don't believe this. This is what these things say. All right? But I'm, it's, I'm mouthing this out, and I hope you hate me for it. And by reaffirming those ideas, it guarantees money to be made. And my point here is, yeah, I haven't seen Bright Wars. I'm not going to watch Bright Wars. I would rather insert heavy objects into myself sideways than watch this film ever. I would rather, you know, spend an hour with a cannibal having been stripped naked and smeared with peanut butter. You know? These are not things that I want to experience. But millions of people do. Lots of people go out and watch this show. They have their reasons, you know, escapism, you know, I want a piece of this glory. I want, I want to spend an hour and a half in the country of Kate and Anne, which is all I wanted as well. That's what you put in the string. So, <clears throat> I'm labouring to make a very simple point. As an industry, Hollywood in particular, looks to reaffirm particular messages <coughs> because they know on an industrial scale that these things work. That means two significant things in terms of Hollywood. One, Hollywood makes particular films. It does not make dangerous films. It does not make films which sit outside the paradigm that it knows works. And two, it makes those films over and over again. There is a repetition about what is produced. Now I'm picking on Hollywood, but that goes for any film industry. You know, the British film industry remakes the same film over and over again. You know, um, when I was younger, you had this cycle of Richard Curtis films. Do you know what I'm talking about, Richard Curtis? You guys are a bit young for this. So in '94, he made Four Weddings and a Funeral. Okay. Terrible piece of shit film. Oh, ghastly awfulness about a bunch of poshos who go to weddings. Fucking awful. In 99, it's Notting Hill. Bunch of poshos sit around in Notting Hill talking about how shit their lives are and falling in love with one another. And then he makes Love Actually. The worst of all of these films. And I can see a few people are like, oh no, Love Actually. Love Actually is the one proof that there is a devil, <laughs> and that he has put people on earth, demons, to lower the standards of existence for the rest of us. Love Island is conclusive, not Love Island, that, that is also conclusive. <laughs> Love actually is proof that there is, that Satan himself controls minions in society. I hate, if, if I could have been on set, 
for love action with an Uzi. The world would be so much better. So. It's not just Hollywood. Industries around the world make the same thing. The music industry is the worst of the lot, in fact. And the music industry is so cynical in this day and age that not only does it make the same kind of things over and over, they even sound exactly the same. Since 1999, the music industry has been heavily using algorithmic tuning of artists to literally make artists sound similar to one another. Their actual singing might be very different, but they use sophisticated algorithmic techniques to hit a sweet spot of how people sound because they know this plays to not better on the radio, but to appeal to the greatest number of people. That does not mean it's a better sound, just because a lot of people like it. A lot of people like Mrs. Brown's voice, you know? That's the fucking worst thing that's ever existed. You know, a lot of people like sadomasochism. It's not for everyone. So, you know, popularity does not mean good. But as an industry, popularity means everything. What's good is not important. You know, things which are artistically worthwhile or have an intrinsic value above the market worth of what is being created. These are not important in an industrial context. What is important is you make something that can realise the profit. So you make something for a certain cost, like Bride Wars. How the hell did this cost 30 million quid? That would be my first question. Those two must be on massive paintings, because the rest of it they must have spent like £8.50. 30 million in, 140 million out. This is what the focus is on. This is why it's an industry. And it's an industry that produces culture, which in this instance is reaffirming particular patriarchal cultural tropes about women in society. That women's focus in society should be on having the perfect wedding thing. Do you know why? Because the rest of your life's going to be fucking shit. So you might as well enjoy them one day. That, and isn't that really what's being said to you? Put everything into this one day, women, because the rest of it is going to be domestic servitude. That's the most grim thing I've ever heard in my life, you know? But this is a continual trope which is played. I didn't note that it's 30 minutes into this lecture and I haven't gone past the title slide yet. That is impressive, even by my shit time sequence. So, who are lecture outline? We're finally moving on. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be talking about Theodore Adorno in particular. Uh, Adorno, a very significant theorist in a number of different fields. Politics, philosophy, literature. Um, and one of the first media theorists. One of the first discernible people you could actually say was interested in media. Adorno's research in the 1930s did focus a lot on media thoughts. So we're going to look at Adorno and the Frankfurt School, what the culture industry is, standardisation, some criticisms of this as well, because albeit this is a powerful argument, it doesn't always hold up to close scrutiny, and how this relates to our culture today. Because, again, a lot of what is being argued in this is a mass media environment. Now I think Adorno's work in particular does still relate to how we consume media and what gets produced today and how culture works, but we have to be careful about applying ideas from this time to the contemporary age, as you know from assignment two, which, by the way, I have completed marking. And, do you know what? It does it, you get the grades back? Yet. Was it next week? I checked this morning. What date? Can anyone do a quick quiz this? What date did it come in? The 3rd. The 3rd. Okay, so it's next week. It's the 24th. You get it back. Um, I was really impressed. Okay? Really, really, really impressed. That's all I'm going to say. A lot of you have got very good grades. I gave people 80. I'm a horrible human being who really resents other people at a deep structural level. To get 80 off me is the equivalent of getting like 140 off another lecture or so. Um, this is uh, Adorno. I, I always like looking at pictures of Adorno because it makes me feel better about my head. 
Because um, he's not a good-looking guy, right? Um, he's got one of those heads which is somewhere between a potato and you know, one of those magic eight balls. Uh, did anyone have one of them as a kid? Yeah. Um, so, there's Theodore, Institute for Social Research, home of the Frankfurt School. It's a grim-looking building. Uh, it got grimmer for uh, members of the Frankfurt School in the 1930s. Frankfurt School was largely made up of Jewish-German intellectuals. Um, anyone want to have a guess what happened to them in the 1930s? <laughs> there must be some students of history in you. Yeah? <laughs> well, not quite that grim. Um, in 1933, when the Nazis came to power in Germany, um, this group were, if you like, downgraded in their university terms. Um, they were excluded from a lot of functions in Frankfurt University. So they left, in fact, very early on as a group, uh, Frankfurt School deep camp to the United States. If you like, they saw the writing on the wall and knew what was coming. This had profound effects on members of the Frankfurt School. Prior, prior to that, if you like, they were almost optimistic about the nature of society. But that change in circumstance for them drove a cynicism about contemporary society which bleeds into the work that the Frankfurt School would do when they were based in the United States as well. They would look at contemporary society and culture, and you might even think, you know, we fled to America, we want to be grateful about being in America, and that actually didn't happen. They were deeply, deeply cynical about American culture as well, because they saw aspects of Western culture in general as being authoritarian, and if not fascist, then the roots of fascism lay across a number of different ideas and culture, not just in Germany. So, in the mid-30s, they go into the United States. And the typical view is encapsulated in this image. As Adorno saw America, he saw it as a teeming mass of people who were continually being bombarded with messages from the mass media. The environment in the United States, this is prior to television, but the environment in the United States was continual bombardment of advertising, bombardment of capitalistic ideas embedded within the kind of media that people were consuming at that time. Newspapers, radio broadcasts, Hollywood cinema. Those were the big, and the music industry at the time a continual bombardment of ideological principles of mass production, buy now, buy this. Your life will be better if you buy all this stuff. Materialism, and if you like the American dream, work hard, buy this stuff, your life will be better. Adorno was deeply cynical about these ideas. You know, there's more to life than just buying shit. But you wouldn't know it from the culture of the time. I'd argue you wouldn't know it from culture today. You know, the entirety of influence of culture on social media is about buying shit. You know, you were bombarded with, look how wonderful my life is. Look how glamorous it is. I'm sitting here on this beach and I look fabulous and so on. And I buy this cream that will make you, I don't know, shit yourself. I don't know what those creams do, but. You know, buy this and you know you will be like me. Spoiler alert, you won't. Don't look like that. So, Dono and his colleagues in America, deeply, deeply cynical. And as Marxists, they were reaffirming the classical Marxist model of how society works. That they perceived American culture and therefore very important to note, even at this stage, that American soft power, so that's a phrase I've probably not used. Is that, does anyone know what that is? Okay, good. In thinking about how states project power across other states, we have two types of power. So you have hard power, which would be military, usually. Military and to a certain extent, aid-based. So, if you're the United States, for example, you have the world's largest military. So your power can come from this form of hard power, where if you have a country that is kicking off a little bit, and you know you don't like what they're doing, like say, I don't know, Iraq, 
you don't need to bombard them with films and music and television. You can just roll your military over there and completely flatten them and take over the country. That is hard power. Soft power is cultural. So this would be the, pro, uh, if you like, the proliferation of American cultural products across the world. So Hollywood, music industry, television, etc. In soft power terms, you know, who watches Friends? Well, you fucking liars, you all watch it. Everyone watches it because it's always on. One person admits to it. Friends, great piece of American soft power. It's translated into everything. Literally, translation of it is all over the place. And what does Friends tell us as a program? It tells us that as a coffee waitress in a coffee shop, you can afford to live in a massive apartment in New York City. That's not true. None of that is true. Okay? Or as you know, a massage therapist, you can live in your own apartment in New York City. Not true. Not even, not even true in the 90s. No way. Friends gives us an idealised version of what American urban life is. It's complete fantasy stuff. But it projects an image of here is an America which is safe, which is affordable, where people can live out their dreams and fantasies in New York City, and quite interestingly, which is white. You know, one of the big problems with Friends is um, it's in one of the most ethnically diverse cities on the planet, and there's only white people in it. Until the, right at the end, when the criticism got so much that they actually put a token black character in as one of Ross's girlfriends. And she's only in for like 10 episodes. But prior to that, it was just like, the program is the whitest fucking program I've ever seen. It's like, this is in New York. If anyone's been to New York, you know your average New Yorker don't look like the people in France. Anyway, this is an example of soft power, rolling out of these kind of things. Now, picking on friends, perhaps unfairly, because soft power, even in the 1930s, was concentrated in Hollywood and the stories and the images that Hollywood constructed, concentrated in the music industry and the kind of things which are pushed out on an industrial scale around the world in order to be popular, and uh, concentrated post-1930s in television. So it, when Adorno and Horkheimer uh, in particular were writing, this is pre-television. Television doesn't actually become a broadcast medium of any significance until after World War II. It's simply the technology wasn't there. But, for our purposes here, we see the classic system that Marx proposed in action. As Adorno observed American culture, he saw that mass production of media by a particular group of people who owned the means of production to produce media, and in his time that was literally production physically, people made records, they made vinyl. They made newspapers. Cinema was made, it was physical. You know, you had reels of film. So you, in order to do all these things, you have to have money, so that people who have that money project particular ideologies and therefore are creating a particular culture which legitimizes their ideologies. This feeds back around in the system and maintains the structures of power in American culture. It's a simple story which I went over a number of weeks ago now. They are not arguing against this. In order to understand how this operated though, instead of being just theoretical, the Frankfurt School actually <coughs> did research. They analysed cinema audiences in the 1940s. They went out and asked cinema audiences, what do you watch? How do you understand these films? What is it that you think the message of this film is? And unsurprisingly, what they found from this kind of research was that audiences would report back that these films are entertaining, these films are a relief from everyday life, without actually commenting on the ideological content of what is being broadcast. The perfect system, if you like, you pump out a load of stuff about the American dream, about how wonderful it is to work hard and get married, have 2.4 children, have a dog, and then you've got the perfect life. 
that ideological message being played over and over again and literally going over people's heads as they said, you know, I really like films with this star in. Or I really like films that make me laugh about these kind of things. So the ideological messages are completely passed over, but they are internalized by the people who are watching them. The reason why they looked at cinema audiences is because cinema in the 1940s was off the scale. It's a shame, I'm not doing media history with you after um, in the next semester because I did used to do a lecture on development of cinema. And I used to I had a whole bunch of images of cinemas that were constructed in the 1920s in the United States. And they're like palaces. It's massive, thousand, two thousand seat cinemas that look like something from the pre-Russian Revolution, pillars and really ornate sort of ceilings, just incredible places to go, full stop. And to go there, so you all watch a movie. You're all watching the same movie. You're all watching the same message. And around the country, everyone's watching the same thing, at the same time. A mass collective audience for the same text over and over again. Because there was nothing else to do. You know, in the 1940s, what else were you going to do? One go to the cinema. So they were interested in this kind of how a mass group was made, how masses in society were constructed, and what was the purpose of that construction was to give these kind of messages through these texts. And already they note that the best way to get a mass audience for your text is to have a particular kind of film, a particular story that the audience is used to, so there's no surprises that they're comfortable with and that has elements which resonate with them in a particular way. So Hollywood is already in the cycle of producing the same thing over and over again. In particular, they were interested in the Western genre, you know, cowboys and so on, which projected ideological messages about patriarchy, you know, the strong man who provides for his family and faces down danger in order to keep his family safe over and over and over again. What does this tell us about men's role in society? You go out to your breadwinner, everyone else is dependent upon you, they're subservient to you. The ideological message of a patriarchal society is embedded into these texts. People would go and watch them. People would be very happy for them. Romantic comedies, really, really important, which, un, you know, not too dissimilar to Bride Wars made 60, 70 years later. Women, entire focus, getting a man, getting them married. Because that's how women become happy in society according to a patriarchal society. You become subservient to men. Over and over and over and over. So, American cinema audiences and what kind of text they received became a very important focus. Led to them to conclude that the culture industry is just a business. There is nothing... Now, this needs unpacking. This phrase really does need unpacking. What they mean here is it's just a business. It has no artistic value. There's nothing intrinsically worthwhile made by the entertainment industry or the culture industry, as they call it. It is just there to make money and produce the same crap over and over and over again. Nothing worthwhile gets made. You're only there to sell. And sell a particular set of images and a particular set of ideologies that are embedded in those images. In addition to that, the culture industry creates false needs. One of the key functions for Adorno of all this was to make people want things that you don't actually need. Now, let's have some participation. Who thinks they know of an example of a false need? Something that you want but don't actually need. A video game? Well, I need them. <laughs> why don't? What? How? Why would we want a video game? 
Where does the desire come from? Because it's entertaining. I guess. I see what you're saying. I, see, I, I get it. That's interesting. Yeah, okay. You've gone way far further than I needed, but yeah, that's okay. Um, let me try and reframe the question. You're not wrong about video games. Nobody needs a video game. We might want them, but nobody needs them. But we can be much more specific about this. Ah, yes. Thank you. Design of clothes. Okay, so, why do we wear clothes? To keep us warm. Do we wear clothes for any other reason? I mean, I'm warm enough at the moment. Could I be not wearing clothes? Thanks, Lauren. You can see Lauren gagging back on sitting in her mouth at that point. Um, <laughs> Okay, so why? Okay, so he's exactly right. We, we need to stay warm, but why else? Individuality. That's interesting. You, you jumped over the point because that was my next one. But yeah, but that's a very good point. Somebody else was saying. Oh yeah, you said to highlight to maintain societal standards on decency. Uh, I think that's a good way of putting it. Okay. So, we need clothes in society because, one, we have a physiological need to stay out of the elements, if you like, to avoid dying of hypothermia. Two, to meet particular societal standards and norms about behaviour and customs of behaviour that we have in particular societies. And three, to express particular, uh, in, you know, to use close symbolically to express something about our identity as individuals. I think mean, those are three fairly good answers. So why do we need designer clothes? Why do you need clothes which, you know, we can have a hoodie, right? Get your hoodie from Primark, Primark, however you want to say that fucking shop. And it's ten bucks. And then Across the road, same hoodie, effectively, branded in different ways, 100 bucks. Why go for the 100 buck one? It's establishing your like, position in society you're aware and all of that, people like to show their off. Yeah, lot. it's an ostentatious display of position, right? You can say to him. Yeah, Okay. Good. <laughs> um, clothes are just clothes, they all do the same job. We have a false need to purchase particular clothes because they meet false demands in society. And there's a wonderful argument that comes up. I, I, I feel like such a misogynist today. Please, any women who want to beat me up in the break, you are more than welcome to. All right? I, I'll be out the back having a cigarette. Come kick my ass. I don't mean any of these things, all right? Is there a culture amongst women in society that once you buy something and wear it to an event, you can't wear it again. Yeah. Okay. Where's that pressure come from? Other women. Thank you. <laughs> Don't come from men, I can assure you, because as a man, I never notice. There is no fucking way I'll be able to tell, right? I do not pay that much attention. None of us do, all right? We are not wired that way. It comes from other women. It's wrong to say it comes just because it's other women. This is a cultural creation, right? It's not other women necessarily. Other women may internalise that message and they would be the ones who would notice. But the message actually comes from above there. It's a cultural establ establishment of cultural norm that once you buy something, you can't work. If you buy something to go to a friend's wedding, you can't wear the same thing. Why not? Who gives a shit? Literally, but it culturally established. Oh no, no, no! I have to go and back out and buy something else, even more expensive this time because everything's gone up in price and so on. Well, 
as an industry, as a cultural industry, fashion has got to be made, right? You spend a load of money on something, and then you can't ever wear it again. So you have to put it on eBay, or you know, put it in the bag for, I don't know, the British Heart Foundation, and it goes on sale, and then it's a completely disposable culture. It's a set of false needs. This is completely fake. There is no, apart from a cultural aspect to this, there is no actual requirement that you have to buy a new outfit for every social event. That doesn't exist. But of course it does exist. It exists in the heads of everyone in a particular culture. It doesn't exist in all cultures. This simply would not wash in some cultures, but it does exist in our culture. And look how two-sided it is. I have one suit. I know you might be thinking, when would you ever wear a suit? Look at the way you dress. Well, let me tell you, there are three reasons why I have a suit. Funerals, weddings, court appearances. <laughs> and you have to select the suit that will fit the three. Now, that does mean I turn up to weddings looking like the accused in an arson case. But I'm, I'm okay with that because I don't really want to go to weddings anyway. Because to share in people's joy, that just isn't my fucking... I'm mean, going to get divorced anyway. So, you know, uh, what's the point? So... But culturally, that's fine. But why is it okay for me to have one suit, which listen, I bought years ago as well. I mean, it looked shit. It looked shit at the time. Why is that okay? It's, why is this double standard? Well, as an industry, you need that double standard. If you didn't have that double standard, the industry, the fashion industry itself, would grind to a halt. You'd buy one thing and you'd wear it all the time. Where's the money in that? You know, it doesn't work that way, right? You need to keep on selling things. Sorry, I've been holding this point. No, that's all right. Um, it was, I was going to say, surely, like, the whole cultural idea of us, or women, needing to get new outfits for different occasions, surely that doesn't come from other women, but from, like, the movies presented, because you never see a... Yeah, well, at the top, this is... You've just exactly preempted where I'm going with it. <laughs> and that's brilliant, because you, let's follow that logically, what you've just said. It comes from movies the fashion industry and the paratext of the fashion industry, which would be fashion magazines, items in newspapers, items on you know, social media, etc. Okay, so at the top level, who are we talking about? Are we talking about women? Is it women that own all these companies? No, who, who is it? Men. Thank you. <laughs> if you want an answer to the actual question, okay, it's not men that are saying it culturally, but it's men that say it economically. Yeah, it's still a patriarchal notion. Culturally, it's expressed and uh, internalised by other women. This is a cultural norm for women, not men. There's no pressure on men to do this. Albeit, I think culturally things have changed, and that there is more pressure on young men now, in particular, to follow these codes of behaviour and to have new things and not be seen wearing last year's shit. Definitely if you look at Instagram influencer culture, that's becoming a major thing. But it's not we're nowhere near as intense as it is culturally for women. So false needs a big aspect of what the culture industry does because as an industry therefore it requires false needs in order for people to keep on spending on these things. I've used fashion as an example. Thank you very much. But this goes just as much for the kind of media that we consume as well. Once you've seen one romantic comedy, let me tell you, you've kind of seen more. You know, they don't change that much. But there's a false need created through advertising, through you know, um, presence of particular actors, through you know, information that's bled out about films, through trailers, etc. that says, oh god, yeah, I really need to go and see that. I really want to go and see the blonde and the brunette fight over the man. Again, I that that make me happy. Somebody might be able to predict what films I'm going to go to town to. Um, actually, let's stop there. Let's take five, and then we'll come back to uh, what they thought was actually. You see, a few of us in this room desperately.
careful coming down here with 